Section 4 of the History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard, Part 3, The Union and National Politics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise of Political Parties Dissension over Hamilton's measures, Hamilton's plan touching deeply as they did the resources of individuals and the interests of the states, awakening alarm and opposition. Funding at face value, said his critics, was a government favor to speculators, and the assumption of state debts was a deep design to undermine the state government. Congress had no constitutional power to create a bank. The law creating the bank merely allowed private corporation to make proper money and lend it at a high rate of interest, and the tariff was a tax on land and labor for the benefit of the manufacturers. Hamilton's reply to this bill of the indictment was simple and straightforward. Some rascally speculators had profited from the funding of the debt at face value, but that was only an incident in the restoration of public credit. In the view of the jealousies of the states, it was a good thing to reduce their powers and pretensions. The Constitution was not to be interrupted narrowly, but in the full light of the national needs. The bank would enlarge the amount of capital so sorely needed to start up the American industries, giving markets to farmers and planters. The tariff, by creating a home market and increasing opportunities for employment, would benefit both land and labor. Out of such wise policies firmly pursued by the government, he concluded, were bound to come strength and prosperity for the new government at home, credit, and power abroad. This view Washington fully endorsed, adding the weight of the great name of the inherited merits on the measures adopted under his administration. The sharpness of partisan conflict, as a result of the clash of opinion, the people of the country gradually divided into two parties, Federalist and Anti-Federalist, the former led by Hamilton, the later by Jefferson. The strength of the Federalists lay in the cities, Boston, Providence, Hartford, New York, Philadelphia, Charleston, among manufacturing, financial, and commercial groups of the population who were eager to extend their business operations, and the strength of the Anti-Federalists lay mainly among the debt-burdened farmers who feared growth of what they called a money power, and planters in all sections who feared dominance of commercial and manufacturing interest. The farming and planting south outside of the few towns finally presented an almost solid front against assumption, the bank, and the tariff. The conflict between the parties grew steadily in bitterness, despite the conciliatory, engaging manner in which Hamilton presented his cause in the state papers, despite the constant efforts Washington to soften the asperity of the contestants. The Leadership and Doctrines of Jefferson The party dispute had not gone far before the opponents of the administration began to look at Jefferson as their leader. Some of Hamilton's measure he had approved, declaring afterwards that he did not, at the time, understand their significance. Others, particularly the bank, he fiercely assailed. More than once, he and Hamilton, shaking violently with anger, attacked each other at cabinet meetings, and nothing short of the grave and dignified pleas of Washington prevented an early and open break between them. In 1794, it had finally came. Jefferson resigned as Secretary of the State and retired to his home in Virginia to assume, through correspondence and negotiation, the leadership of a steady-growing party of opposition. Shy and modest in manner, halting in speech, disliking the turmoil of public debate, and deeply interested in science and philosophy, Jefferson was not very well fitted for the strenuous life of political contest. Nevertheless, he was an ambitious and shrewd negotiator. He was also, by honest opinion, matured conviction, the exact opposite of Hamilton. The latter believed in a strong, active, high-toned government, vigorously compelling in all its branches. Jefferson looked at such a government as dangerous to the liberties of citizens and openly avowed his faith in the desirability of the occasional popular uprising. 
Hamilton distrusted people, quote, your people is a great beast, he is reported to have said. Jefferson professed his faith in the people with an abandon that was considered reckless in his time. On economic matters, the opinions of two leaders were also hopelessly at variance. Hamilton, while cherishing agriculture, desired to see America a great commercial and industrial nation. Jefferson was equally set against the course for his country. He had feared that the accumulation of riches and growth in large urban working class, the mobs of great cities, he said, are sores on the body politic. Artisans are usually the dangerous element that make revolutions. Workshops should be kept in Europe, and with them the artisans and their insidious morals and manners. The only substantial foundation for a republic, Jefferson believed, to be agriculture. The spirit of independence could only be kept alive by free farmers owning land they tilled and looking to the sun and heaven and the labor of their hands for their sustenance. Trusting as he did in the innate goodness of human nature when nourished on a free soil, Jefferson advocated those measures and calculated to favor agriculture to enlarge the rights of the persons rather than the powers of government. Thus he became a champion of the individual against interference of the government and an ardent advocate of freedom of the press, freedom of speech, freedom of scientific inquiry. It was, accordingly, no more fictitious of spirit that drove him into opposition to Hamilton. The Whiskey Rebellion The political agitation of the Anti-Federalists was accompanied by an armed revolt against the government in 1794. The occasion for this uprising was another of Hamilton's measures, a law laying an excise tax on distilled spirits, for the purpose of increasing revenue needed to pay the interest of the funded debt. It so happened to be a very considerable part of the whiskey manufacture in the country was made by farmers, especially on the frontier, in their own stills. The new revenue law meant that federal officers would now come into the homes of people, measure their liquor, and take the taxes out of their pockets. All the bitterness of the farmers felt against the fiscal measures of the government was redoubled. In the western districts of Pennsylvania, Virginia, and North Carolina, they refused to pay the tax. In Pennsylvania, some of them sacked and burned the houses of the debt collectors, as the revolutionists thirty years before had mobbed against agents of King George, sent over to sell stamps. They were in a far away to nullify the law in the whole districts when Washington called out the troops to suppress, quote, the Whiskey Rebellion. Then the movement collapsed, but it left behind deep-seated resentment which flared up in the election of several aldrich anti-federalist congressmen from the disaffected region. The French Revolution In this exciting period, when all of America was distracted by partisan disputes, a storm broke out in Europe, an epoch-making French Revolution, which not only shook the thrones of the old world, but stirred into its depths a young republic in the new world. The first scene of this dramatic affair occurred in the spring of 1789, a few days after Washington was inaugurated. The King of France, Louis the Sixteenth, driven into bankruptcy by extravagance and costly wars, he was forced to resort to his people for financial help. Accordingly, he called for the first time in more than 150 years a meeting of the national parliaments the Estates General, composed of representatives of the three estates, the clergy, nobility, and commoners. Acting under powerful leaders as commoner or the third estate, swept aside the clergy and nobility and resolved themselves into national assembly. This stirred the country to its depths. Louis the Sixteenth in the Hands of the Mob Great events followed the Swiss succession. On July 14, 1789, the Bastille, an old royal prison, a symbol of the king's absolutionism, was stormed by a Paris crowd and destroyed. On the night of August 4th, the feudal privileges of the nobility were abolished by the National Assembly amid great excitement. A few days later came the famous Declaration of the Rights of Man, proclaiming sovereignty of the people and privileges of its citizens. In autumn 1791, Louis XVI was forced to accept a new constitution for France, 
vesting legislative power in a popular assembly. Little disorder accompanied these startling changes. To all appearances, a peaceful revolution had stripped the French king of his royal prerogatives and based the government of his country and the consent of the governed. American Influence in France In undertaking their great political revolt, the French had been encouraged by the outcome of the American Revolution. Officers and soldiers who had served in the American War reported to their French countrymen of marvelous tales at the frugal table of General Washington in a council of the unpretentious Franklin or at the conferences over the strategy of war, French noblemen of the ancient lineage learned to respect both the talents and the simple character of the leaders in the great Republican Commonwealth beyond the seas. Travelers who had gone to see the experiment in Republicanism with their own eyes carried home to the king and ruling class stories of astounding system of popular government. On the other hand, dalliance with American democracy was regarded by the French conservatives as playing with fire. Quote, when we think of false ideas of government and philanthropy, wrote one of Lafayette's aides, which these youth acquired in America and propagated in France with so much enthusiasm and such deplorable success, for this mania of intimidation powerfully aided revolution, although it was not the sole cause of it. We are bound to confess that it w would have been better, both for themselves and for us, if these young philosophers in red-heeled shoes would stay at home in attendance on the court. Early American Opinion of the French Revolution So close to the ties between the two nations that it is not surprising to find every step in the first stages of the French Revolution greeted with applause in the United States. Quote, Liberty will have another feather in her cap, exuberantly wrote a Boston editor. In no part of the globe, soberly wrote John Marshall, was this revolution hailed with more joy than in America. But one sentiment existed. The main key to Bastille, sent Washington as a memento, was accepted as a token of victory gained by liberty, Thomas Paine saw, the great event, the first ripe fruits of the American principle transplanted into Europe. Federalists and Anti-Federalists regarded the new Constitution of France as another vindication of American ideals. The Reign of Terror While profuse congratulations were being exchanged, rumors began to come that all was not well in France. Many noblemen, enraged at the loss of their special privileges, fled into Germany and plotted an invasion of France to overthrow the new system of government. Louis the Sixteenth entered into the negotiations with his brother monarchs, on content to secure their help in the same enterprise, and he finally betrayed the French people his true sentiment by attempting to escape his kingdom, only to be captured and taken back to Paris in disgrace. A new phase of government had now opened. The working people, excluded from all share of government by the first French constitution, became restless, especially in Paris. Assembling the Champs de Mars, a great open field, they signed a petition calling for another constitution, giving them suffrage. When told to disperse, they refused and were fired upon by the National Guard. This massacre, as it was called, enraged the populace. A radical party, known as the Jacobins, then sprang up, taking its name from Jacobin Monastery, in which it held its sessions. A little while it became a master of a popular convention, convoked in September of 1792. The monarch was immediately abolished and the republic established. On January 21, 1793, Louis was sent to the scaffold. To the war in Austria, already raging, was added a war on England. Then came a reign of terror, during which radicals in possession of the convention executed in large number counter-revolutionists and the suspected sympathy of those with the monarchy. They shot down peasants who rose in the insurrection against their rule and established a relentless dictatorship. Civil war followed. Terrible atrocities were committed on both sides in the name of liberty and in the name of monarchy. To Americans of the conservative temper, it was now seen that the revolution, so auspiciously begun, had degraded into anarchy and mere bloodthirsty strife.
Burke summons to the World War on France. In England, Edmund Burke led the fight against the new French principles in which he feared might spread to all of Europe. In his reflections on the French Revolution, written in 1790, he attacked with terrible wrath the whole program of popular government. He called for war, relentless war, upon the French as monsters and outlaws. He demanded that they be reduced to order by the restoration of the king to full power under the protection of the arms of the European nation. Paine's Defense of the French Revolution To counteract the campaign of hate against the French, Thomas Paine replied to Burke in another of the famous tracts, The Rights of Man, which was given to the American public in an edition containing the letter of approval from Jefferson. Burke said Paine had now been mourning about the glories of the French monarchy and aristocracy, but had not forgotten the starving peasants and the oppressed people. He had wept over plumage and neglected the dying Burke. Burke had denied the right of the French people to choose their own governors, blindly forgetting that the English government, in which he saw final protection itself, rested on two revolutions. He had boasted that the King of England held his crown in contempt of the democratic societies. Payne answered, If I ask a man in America if he wants a king, he retorts and asks me if I take him for an idiot. To the charge of the doctrines of the rights of man were newfangled, Payne replied that the question was not whether they were new or old, or whether they were right or wrong. As the French disorders and difficulties, he bade the world to wait and see what would be brought forth in due time. The Effect of the French Revolution on American Politics The course of the French Revolution and the controversies accompanying it exercised profound influence on the formation of the first political parties in America. The followers of Hamilton, now proud of the name Federalist, drew back in fright as they heard of the cruel deeds committed during the Reign of Terror. They turned savagely upon the revolutionists and their friends in America, denouncing as Jacobin everybody who did not condemn loudly enough the proceedings of the French Republic, as a Massachusetts preacher roundly assailed that the aesthetical, anarchical, and other respects, immoral principles of the French Republicans. He then proceeded with equal passion to attack Jefferson and the other anti-federalists, whom he charged with spreading false French propaganda and portraying America. The editors, patrons, and abettors of these vehicles of slander, he exclaimed, ought to be considered and treated as enemies of their country. Of all traitors who are most aggravantly criminal, of all villains, they are most infamous and detestable. The anti-federalists, as a matter of fact, were generally favorable to the revolution, although they deplored many of the events associated with it. Payne's pamphlet, endorsed by Jefferson, was widely read. Democratic societies, after the fashion of French political clubs, arose in the cities. The coalition of European monarchs against France was denounced as a coalition against the very principles of republicanism, and the execution of Louis the Sixteenth was openly celebrated at the banquet in Philadelphia. Harmless titles, such as Sir and the Honorable and His Excellency, were decried as aristocratic, and some of the more excited insisted on adopting the French title Citizen, speaking, for example, Citizen Judge, Citizen Toastmaster. Pamphlets were in defense of the French, streamed from the press, while subsidized newspapers kept propaganda in full swing. The European War Disturbs the American Commerce This battle of wits, or rather the contest and colony, might have gone on indefinitely in America without producing any serious results had it not been for the war between England and France then raging. The English, having a command of the seas, claimed the right to seize American produce bound for French ports and to confiscate American ships that carry French goods. Adding fuel to the fire already hot enough, they began to search for American ships and to carry off British foreign sailors they found on American vessels. The French Appeal for Help At the same time the French Republican turned to the United States for aid, 
and is for an England sent over his diplomatic representative, Citizen Ghent, an ardent supporter of the new order. On his arrival at Charleston, he was greeted with fervor by the Anti-Federalists, and made his way north, he was wined and dined and given popular ovations that turned his head. He thought the whole country was ready to join the French Revolution in his contest with England. Gannett therefore attempted to use American ports as a base of operations for French privateers preying on British merchant ships. He insisted that the United States was in honor bound to help France under the Treaty of 1778. The Proclamation of Neutrality and the Jay Treaty Unmoved by the rising tide of popular sympathy for France, Washington took a firm course. He received Ghent coldly. The demand that the United States aid France under the old Treaty of Alliance, he answered by proclaiming the neutrality of America and warning American citizens against hostile acts towards either France or England. When Gannett continued to hold meetings and issue manifestos, the stirrup between people against England and Washington asked the French government to recall him. This act followed by the sending of Chief Justice John Jay on a Pacific mission to England. The result was celebrated Jay Treaty of 1794. By its terms, the Great Britain agreed to withdraw her troops from the western forts where they have been since the war for independence and grant certain slight of trade concessions. The chief sources of bitterness the failure of British to return slaves carried off during the revolution, the seizure of American ships, the impressment of sailors, were not touched, much to the distress of everybody in America, including loyal Federalists. Nevertheless, Washington dreaded the armed conflict which England urged the Senate to ratify the treaty. The weight of his influence carried the day. At this, the hostility of the Anti-Federalists knew no bounds. Jefferson declared that the Jay Treaty, quote, an infamous act which is really nothing more than an alliance between England and the Anglo-men of this country against the legislature of the people of the United States. Hamilton, defending it in his usual courage, was stoned by a mob in New York and driven from the platform with blood streaming from his face. Jay burned in effigy. Even Washington was not spared. The House of Representatives was openly hostile. To display the feelings, it called upon the President for papers relative to the treaty negotiations, only to be more highly incensed by the flat refusal to present them, on the ground that the House did not share in the same treaty-making power. Washington retires from politics. Such angry contests confirmed the President in slowly maturing determination to retire at the end of his second term in office. He did not believe that a third term was unconstitutional or improper, but worn by the long and arduous labors in war and in peace, and wounded by harsh attacks from former friends, he longed for the quiet of his beautiful estate at Mount Vernon. In September of 1796, on the eve of the presidential election, Washington issued his farewell address, another state paper to be treasured and read by generations of Americans to come. In this address, he directed the attention of the people to three subjects of lasting interest. He warned them against sectional jealousies. He remonstrated against the spirit of partisanship, saying that in government, quote, of popular character, in government purely elective, it is in the spirit not to be encouraged. He likewise cautioned people against, quote, the insidious wails of foreign influence, saying that, Europe has set a primary interest, which to us have none or very remote relation. Hence, she must be engaged in frequent controversies, the causes of which are essentially foreign to our concerns. Hence, therefore, it would be unwise for us to implicate ourselves by artificial ties in ordinary vicissitudes of her politics or ordinary combinations and collisions of her friendships or in enemies. Why forego the advantages of such a peculiar situation? It is our true policy to steer clear of the permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world, taking care to keep ourselves by suitable establishments on a respectable and defensive posture. We may safely trust to temporary alliances for an extraordinary emergencies. The Campaign of 1796 Adams Elected on hearing of the retirement of Washington, the Anti-Federalists 
cast off all restraints. In the honor of France and the opposition to what they were pleased to call the monarchical tendencies of the Federalists, they boldly assumed that the name Republican, the term Democrat, then applied to only to obscure and despised radicals that had not come into general use. They selected Jefferson as a candidate for president against John Adams, and the Federalist nominee carried the spirited campaign that came with four votes of electing him. The successful candidate, Adams, was not fitted by training or opinion on conciliating determined opposition. He was reserved for the studious man. He was neither a good speaker nor a skillful negotiator. In one of his books, he had declared himself in favor of a, quote, government by an aristocracy of talents and wealth, an offense which Republicans never forgave, while John Marshall found him a sensible, plain, candid, and good-tempered man. Jefferson could see in him nothing but a monocrat and an Angloman. It had not been for the conduct of the French government, Adams would hardly have enjoyed a moment of genuine popularity during his administration. The Quarrel with France The French Directory of the Executive Department established under the Constitution of 1795 managed, however, to stir anger of Republicans and Federalists alike. In the regard to the Jay Treaty and the rebuke of France, the flag flagrant violation of the obligations solemnly registered in the Treaty of 1778, accordingly, it refused to receive American minister, treated him in a humiliating way, and finally told him to leave the country. Overlooking this affront and the anxiety to maintain peace, Adams dispatched to France a commission of eminent men with instructions to reach the understanding with the French Republic. On their arrival, they were challenged to find, instead of a decent reception, an indirect demand for apology respecting the past conduct of the American government, a payment in cash, and an annual tribute as the price of their continued friendship. With the news of this affair reached President Adams, he promptly laid it before Congress, referring to the Frenchmen who had made the demands as Mr. X, Mr. Y, and Mr. Z. This insult, coupled with the fact that the French privateers, like the British, were preying on American commerce, enraged even the Republicans who had the loudest in the profession of their French sympathies. They forgot their wrath over the Jay Treaty and joined with the Federalists in shouting, Millions for defense, not a cent for tribute. Preparations for war were made in every hand. Washington was once more called from Mount Vernon to take his old position at the head of the army. Indeed, fighting actually began on the high seas and went on without formal declaration of war until the year 1800. By that time, the directory had been overthrown. A treaty was readily made with Napoleon, the first consul, who was beginning his remarkable career as the chief of the French Republic, soon to be turned into an empire. Alien and Sedition Laws Flourished with success, the Federalists determined, if possible, to put an end to the radical French influence in America and to silence the Republican opposition. They therefore passed two drastic laws in the summer of 1798, the Alien and Sedition Acts. The first of these measures empowered President to expel from the country or to imprison any alien whom he regarded as dangerous or had reasonable grounds to suspect of any treasonable or secret machinations against the government. The second of measures, the Sedition Act, penalized not only those who attempted to stir up unlawful combinations against the government, but also everyone who wrote, uttered, or published, quote, any false, scandalous, or malicious writing against the government of the United States, or either the House of Congress, or the President of the United States, with intent to defame said government, or to bring them, or either of them, into contempt or disrepute. This measure was hurried through Congress in spite of the opposition and clear provision in the Constitution that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Even many Federalists feared that the consequences of the action. Hamilton was alarmed when he read the bill, exclaiming, Let us not establish a tyranny. Energy is very different from thing from violence. John Marshall told his friends in Virginia that 
he had been in Congress that he would have opposed two bills because he thought them useless, calculated to create unnecessary discontents and jealousies. The alien law was not enforced, but was given great offense to the Irish and French whose activities against the American government's policy respecting Great Britain to put in the danger of prison. The sedation law, on the other hand, was vigorously applied. Several editors of the Republican newspapers soon found themselves in jail or broken by ruinous fines for their catastic criticism of the Federalist president and his policies. Bystanders at political meetings who uttered sentiments which, through ungenerous and severe seeming harmless enough now, were hurried before a Federalist judge and promptly fined and imprisoned. Although the prosecutions were not numerous, they aroused a keen resentment. The Republicans were convinced that their political opponents, having settled upon the countries in Hamilton's fiscal system and the British treaty, were bent on silencing all censure. The measure, therefore, had exactly the opposite effect on which their authorities intended. Instead of helping the Federalist Party, they made criticism of once more bitter than ever. The Kentucky and Virginia Revolutions Jefferson was quick to take advantage of the discontent. He drafted a set of revolutions declaring the sedition law null and void, violating the federal constitution. His resolutions were passed by the Kentucky legislature late in 1798, signed by the governor and transmitted to other states for their consideration. Though receiving unfavorable replies for a number of northern states, Kentucky followed year, reaffirmed its position, and declared that the nullification of all unconstitutional acts of Congress was the right remedy to be used by the states in the readiness of grievances. It was thus defied the American government and announced a doctrine hostile to nationality and fraught with a terrible meaning for the future. In the neighboring state of Virginia, Madison led a movement against the alien and sedition laws. He induced legislature to pass resolutions condemning the acts as unconstitutional and calling upon the other states to take proper measures to preserve their rights and the rights of the people. The Republican Triumph in the 1800. Thus the way was prepared for the election of 1800. The Republican left no stone unturned in their efforts to place the Federalist candidate, President Adams, all the odom of the alien and sedition laws. In addition to the responsibility for approving Hamilton's measures and policies, the Federalists, divided in councils and cold in their affection for Adams, made poor campaign. They tried to discredit their opponents with epithets of Jacobians and the anarchists in terms to be weakened by excessive use. When the vote was counted, it was found that Adams had been defeated. While the Republicans had carried the entire South and New York, also secured eight of the fifteen electoral votes cast by Pennsylvania. Quote, Our beloved Adams will now close his bright career, lamented a Federalist newspaper. Sons of faction, demagogues, high priests of anarchy, now you have cause to triumph. A quarrel between Federalists and Republican in the House of Representatives. Jefferson's election, however, was still uncertain. By a curious provision of the Constitution, presidential electors were required to vote for two persons without indicating which office was each to fill. One was receiving the highest number of votes to be the president, and candidate standing next to be vice president. It so happened that Aaron Burr, the Republican candidate for vice president had received the same number of votes as Jefferson, and neither a majority of the election was thrown into the House of Representatives, while the Federalists held the balance of power, although it was well known that Burr was not even a candidate for president. His friends and many of the Federalists began intriguing his election to the high office. Had it not been for the vigorous action of Hamilton, the prize might have been snatched out of Jefferson's hand. Not until 36 ballot on February 17, 1801, was the great issue decided in his favor. References G.S. Bassett, The Federalist System, American National Series C.A. Beard, Economic Origins of the Jeffersonian Democracy H. Lodge, Alexander Hamilton J.T. Morse Thomas Jefferson. Questions. Who were the leaders of the first administration under the Constitution? 
2. What step was taken to appease the opposition? 3. Enumerate Hamilton's great measures to explain in each detail. 4. Show the connection between the parts of Hamilton's system. 5. Contrast the general political views of Hamilton and Jefferson. 6. What were the important results of the peaceful French Revolution, 1789-92? to 92? 7. Explain the interaction of the opinion between France and the United States. 8. How did the reign of terror change American opinion? 9. What was the Burke Payne controversy? 10. Show how the war in Europe affected American commerce and involved America with England and France. 11. What were American policies with regard to each of those countries? 12. What was the outcome of the Alien and Sedition Acts? Research Topics Early Federal Legislation Command Industrial History of the United States Page 133-156 to 156, Elson History of the United States Page 341-348 to 348, Hamilton Report on Public Credit MacDonald Documentary Source Book Page 233-243 to 243, The French Revolution Robinson and Beard Development of Modern Europe Volume 1 Pages 224 to 282. Elson, page 351 to 354. The Burke Payne Controversy. Make an analysis of Burke's reflection on the French Revolution and Payne Rights of Man. Alien and Sedition Act. MacDonald, Documentary Sourcebook. Page 259 to 267. Elson, pages 367 to 375. Kentucky and Virginian Resolutions. MacDonald, page 267 to 278. Source Studies, Materials and Heart, American History Told by Contemporaries, Volume 3, pages 255 to 343. Biographical Studies, Alexander Hamilton, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and Albert Gallington. The Twelfth Amendment contrasts the provision in original Constitution with terms of the amendment. See Appendix. Footnotes. 1. North Carolina ratified November 1789 and Rhode Island in May of 1790. 2. To prevent repetition of such an unfortunate affair, the Twelfth Amendment of the Constitution was adopted in 1804, changing slightly the method of electing the President. End of section 4.